So last week, we got ourselves off to a great start looking at our first piece of our picture of Jesus and a, a central piece that we talked about last week where we said, he is the word made flesh. And he himself is God of very God, the light that cannot be extinguished, stamped out, and who brings grace and truth in full measure, and especially in full measure to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, because that promise is for all who accepted, all who called on his name, John 1:12, you get the right to become a child of God being a child of God with all its rights, privileges, and responsibilities. So last week, on your handout, you had some discussion questions, which you went through in your group. On the back was the rest of John chapter one with one question on it. The one question was, what are other people saying about Jesus at his own time when he was walking the earth? So now bringing it into today, I want you guys to shout out for those who might be like, okay, or at least put up with Jesus in today's world, what might they say about him? Okay, let's get some volunteers. What people who maybe are okay with him? Yeah. Okay, he's a good teacher. Yep, I think a decent amount of people would say that. What else might people say? Say again? A prophet. Mm -hmm. Okay. What other things? Religious. He's religious. Say he's crazy. Yes. For people who reject, uh, that guy's crazy. Okay. Now, so that's the next question is, what would people who are going to reject him today, some might say he's crazy. What else might they say if they're going to reject Jesus? He's a liar. He's, a liar. he's just a man. He's just a man. Ooh, never existed. That's slowly but surely becoming popular, okay? Now, serious scholars are gonna dismiss that. Like, really? The person who changed a massive course of history never existed, okay? What else might people say who reject him? A heretic, yeah, because what happens to him? The religious establishment of the day doesn't like that. No, oh, he's a heretic, let's get him, let's ax this guy, okay? Any other things that people might say today who reject Jesus? The earth is flat. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Let's <laughs> I don't have anything to say to that one. Yeah. Okay. Some even might even say, oh, he was not a very strong revolutionary because his revolution kind of didn't take shape that well. He didn't become a global leader, he didn't become like a emperor or anything like that. You dismiss him. Some people will reject Jesus nowadays because of a false picture of who Jesus is. So I've got a couple of pictures up here for you guys to look at to see what is on this picture about who Jesus is. Okay, how about the first one, Kenny? A first picture of who Jesus is. Okay, what do we think? An inventor. An inventor. Mm, maybe a little bit of an uh, enlightened hippie? John Lennon, maybe? Okay, all right. Okay, how about the next one? What do we think here? Angry. Everything, and he's even got that thing out ready to... Okay, how about the next one? Sad, serious. Uh, some of you might not be able to see, but he does have the crown of thorns on. That would be a time to be solemn and for his life, okay? And how about one more? Savior. Savior. He's saving this guy who is weak and completely lost of strength. Okay, if you zoom in on this picture, you'll see the holes in his hands, right? He is holding him up by his own strength. 
So all of these pictures are helpful because they get at a specific piece of who Jesus is. As we continue our study of the Gospel of John, we're gonna be building a composite picture. As we build our composite picture of who Jesus is, you yourself might have to change or revise your own understanding to bring it into conformity with what has been revealed of who he is, his claims, and then your own allegiance and convictions about him. The same happened to the people in his day. Because when we read the passage last week, it was before he was born. Now we're gonna fast forward a few decades. During those decades, there's lots of people who saw Jesus walk and talk and do various things, practice his craft that passed down from his father, okay, working with his hands. And they had to adjust what their expectations was. Before Jesus got in public ministry and started doing all these other things that we see recorded, there's plenty of people who know him before then. Another group of people that will have to change their expectations are the disciples. He goes and calls some of them, and a lot of them come with preconceived notions. Great, if you're the Messiah, you're going to deliver us from Rome, who oppresses us. We do not have our own freedom. You're gonna restore Israel to its former glory, okay? That is their perception of what that Messiah is gonna do. We might have to lay down some of our own perceptions from selfish desires or maybe a pluralistic thing where, well, I'll have a little bit of Jesus and have a little bit of this, have a little bit of that, like a salad bar, where he's just one of the many toppings. Laying them down and picking up the truth about who Jesus is. So we're going to get another piece of who Jesus is with our first sign. So our first sign takes place in John chapter two, okay? So go ahead and open up to John chapter two. This first sign is at a wedding, okay? The wedding in the first century when he is around is very different than ours. Typically, I imagine everybody in here has been to a wedding. The ceremony part maybe lasts, I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and then you have dinner and maybe some dancing afterwards. And then the couple leaves to consummate their marriage, then goes off on their honeymoon and then comes back later. Okay, a typical maybe Western wedding. In the first century though, it's different. A wedding feast could have lasted several days, maybe a week or so. The feast, would happen after the groom has taken his bride to his home or to the home of his father where he's built an extra room. Before they consummate the marriage, the feast is happening. The guests would bring gifts and then the bride and groom, their responsibility is to provide a good feast with wine and food. In a small town like in here in this case, a wedding feast would have been quite a community celebration. There would have been a lot of witnesses. A lot of people would have known each other and they would have been celebrating throughout this time. So let's go ahead and read chapter two, verses one to three. Now on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine left. Hmm. First off, first observation, this is very smart to invite Jesus to your wedding. Good idea. So if Jesus gets an invite and his disciples get an invite along with Mary, they probably know this family, this couple. Okay, so their wine runs out. What's at stake? Well, not just that the party ends, okay? But a couple of big things that are at stake here. Shame and disgrace. Everybody that is in your town knows you did not handle this feast well. You did not handle your end 
of the obligation. And in this closely knit community, they're not gonna live it down. It is probably going to be a black mark for them for a long time. Another aspect, financial embarrassment. If they don't fulfill their end, they could risk losing the gifts that were brought. They could risk losing a decent percentage of the gifts that were brought to their wedding feast. Up to possibly half. That's a substantial start to your new married life. Mary asks her son, because she knows the situation probably is related or knows this family personally, and she doesn't want to see this social disgrace come upon them, which is interesting because Mary has probably experienced a lot of social disgrace herself. A lot of people wonder, who is this Jesus? Is he a legitimate child? She probably has to live with that decent amount of shame for a long time before it becomes apparent, ooh, this is the savior of the world, okay? She does not want that for this family. She asked Jesus to intercede. Let's continue reading, verses four and five. Jesus replied, woman, why are you saying this to me? My time has not yet come. His mother told the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Rude, woman. Okay, this is not rude. This is just a respectful statement. Excuse me, madam, what, what does what you're saying have to do with me? Okay, it's a polite expression, but is an expression to describe a difference in relationship now. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus never refers to Mary as mother. Never does. It's to make this differentiation. We are now entering into a new kind of relationship as he's entering into public ministry and it's going to become more clear the truth of what she's believed, it's now a distance. Hey, we are now concerned about different things. What is Jesus concerned about? The will of the Father. She's, he's saying, what does this have to do with me? My time has not yet come. His obedience to the Father is more important than his obedience to his mother. So let's read a couple more verses here. Now, there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washing, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Okay, so a good Jew, especially if there's Pharisees there, they would come in, use this water to purify themselves through purification rites. Jesus told the servants, fill the water jars with water. So they filled them up to the very top. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the head steward, and they did. So Jesus is going to turn old water, this purification water, into new wine. This is perhaps 150 gallons worth of wine. That's a lot. And he's taking the old order, these purification, and turning it into a new way. For those Jews that were there, if they knew that it came out of those purification jars, they would be in disgust. They would not touch it. But let's see what happens. Verse nine to 11. When the head steward tasted the water that had been turned to wine, not knowing where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the cheaper wine when the guests are drunk. You have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the first of his miraculous signs in Cana of Galilee. In this way, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay, this is not 
a magic trick. This is indeed a miracle. He turns the water into wine, not just okay wine, as you diluted it with water, turned it into new good wine. This good wine has aged in a mere moment. Now, last week, we made this statement at the beginning of John 1, that he is the creator. Nothing has been made that exists that he, did, that he made. All things were made by him. So as creator, he orchestrates this process on a yearly basis. Now he just sped up the process instantaneously to have good wine. God in the flesh has brought about a miraculous deed. Now we're not gonna turn to all these places, but this is something you should expect from the Messiah. Psalm 104.15, Jeremiah 31.12, Joel 2.19 and 24, Zechariah 9.17, talks about the Messiah and the Lord bringing wine for his people in abundance. And he does that here. When I look through this story, I see at least four things of Jesus in this first sign. The first one, Captain Obvious here, power. He demonstrates power. It's, this is quite the first sign to choose. He's going to show that he's Lord over creation by being able to change this. The claim he made at the beginning is now starting to be validated. All things were created by him. The second thing I think of is joy. A few minutes ago, what did we ask? We could ask the question of people's misconceptions about Jesus. One of those misconceptions could be, no, nobody volunteered it, but it could be that God is a cosmic killjoy. He's just gonna load you up with burden after burden after burden, so much so that you will not have room for joy. That God is only interested in giving tasks to wear you out. That only phrase, cosmic killjoy phrase, sometimes comes up when things get hard. But the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the most joyous being in all creation. He is the most joyous being. So his invitation for you to leave all these other false gods and idols is very serious because he knows who he is. And that invitation to come after him is good because he is the most joyous. Nothing else will satisfy. The third thing I see, it's his mission on his terms. He isn't just listening to mommy. He is saying, now I choose to do this and I'm going to continue to show these signs because my time is getting closer and closer and it will be here in just a few years. His mission is in perfect harmony with the Father's will, but he lets it come on his own time. The last thing I see is change. Not that he changes, but that he changed the water to wine. And what does that do for this couple? It saves them from financial and social disgrace. He does that as joy for them and to prevent a poor start to their marriage. He has the ability to not just change that, but to change other things like you and I. So, as we look at this first sign and the next few signs, you might need to start asking yourself some questions. What are you willing to give up when you're faced with the truth? What are you willing to do to have the greatest, which is Jesus Christ? What is it like to have him as Lord over your life instead of yourself, because sometimes it's, it's hard to give up the fact that you're not the one calling all the shots anymore when you come into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's a good thing that you're not calling on the shots because God also gives another promise that he can do far more abundantly than you can ask or imagine. Sign me up for that. Sign me up for that. Even if it costs me having to come out of the darkness that I thought was good and to come into the light and walk in his ways, to walk in what is good, true, righteous. Let's take some time to pray before we head into our small groups. God, thank you for one promise last week, another promise this week, a chance to see more about who you are. Help us to bring our lives in alignment with that truth, that we might see you, treasure you, and for us who have not come to know you, uh, that they would call on your name for the first time. Pray that you bless our conversation tonight, that we do things to glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.